got one here I'm just open to give to somebody. Somebody like this one? You want to use this one? Okay, now I'm going to put it on the front row. I was going to open its place and everything. There it is, Nehemiah chapter 5. You don't know what to do. It's sitting right there. Open. Why is it we open Bibles in our church? See what the Word of God says. We want to know what God says. Do you know that there's no way in the world that anybody knows God without His Word? There are a lot of people who have a concept of God. And it's interesting that if anyone was correct in their concept for God, their being right would make everyone else wrong. Isn't it true? In other words, if God is who you think He is, then He's not who someone else thinks He is. And the reality of it is that God is who He says He is. And uh, if we want to know who God is, then we need to know Him as He is. And so this is why we open a Bible. This is God's Word. And if you'll take the time to study it and read it, you'll be convinced, you'll be persuaded that this book indeed is the Word of God. And so here we are in Nehemiah chapter 5 this evening. And we'll do some brief review after we read our text. But I want to read this scenario that unfolds beginning in verse 1 and going all the way down to <clears throat> verse 11. No, verse 12. And then uh, we'll pray and ask the Lord to help. Verse 1, the Bible says, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the bre their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There were also that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers, and said unto them, Ye exact usury every one of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them, and I said unto them, We, after our ability, have redeemed our brethren the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will ye even sell your brethren, or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace, and found nothing to answer. And I said, It is not good that ye do. Ought ye not to walk in the fear of God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise and my brethren and my servants might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses, also the hundredth part of the money, and of the corn, the wine, and the oil, that ye exact of them. Then said they, We will restore them, and will require nothing of them. So will we do as thou sayest? Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Now let's pray, and we'll ask the Lord to help us tonight to learn some principles that I believe are life-shaking, earth-shaking, and life-changing uh, for anyone that will obey and practice them. So let's pray. Father, please help us tonight as we look at practical events that happened among God's people, national Israel, when they were rebuilding. And Father, I pray that you would help us to understand that the same truths that have to do with love of brethren, that have to do with love for you, and that have to do with serving you, are true today because you're the same God. And so I pray that you would give us wisdom now, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been in Nehemiah for a couple of weeks now. Uh, this is a very, very interesting historic book that helps us to understand what happened after the captivity. Now you remember, if you've read Daniel, that how long the captivity, Daniel understood that the captivity was supposed to be, don't you? Uh, how long, according to what Daniel understood when he read Jeremiah and Isaiah, how long was the captivity supposed 70. to be? What? 70 years. 70 years. And so it's been way after 70 years, and, the, and there's actually a decree that the Jews are allowed to go back to Jerusalem from the captivity, and Nehemiah was the king's uh, the king's cupbearer, and he was in the household of the king, not the king of Jerusalem, of course, would have been King Ahasuerus. And as he is in, as he is 
serving the king as his cupbearer in a trusted position, some of his brethren came from Jerusalem, and he asked them the question, he said, how's the rebuilding of Jerusalem? And they told him basically, well, the walls are broken down, the gates are burnt or in disrepair, and the people are very, very vulnerable. They're being continually, constantly plundered, and there's been no rebuilding of the city. And it really bothered Nehemiah because Nehemiah recognized that the captivity was for a prescribed amount of time and that the plight of God's people was a reflection of God. In other words, if they are being plundered and destroyed, if they're a downtrodden, downcast people who can't seem uh, to even make ends meet, seem as though terrible things are continually happening to them, then what does it say about their God? And so Nehemiah was offended. He was bothered for the testimony of God. And he took it very, very personally. Now you and I looked at how that Nehemiah could have very, very easily excused his personal responsibility. In other words, he had a job, he had a calling, he had a position. And you know, I think what, the, as I think about it, I think the easiest thing for Nehemiah to have done would be to have sent some support to Jerusalem. You ever think about that? The easiest thing he could have done would have been said, Here's some money. To the, I mean, he had money. He worked for the king. He was the, he was the most trusted person in, under Ahasuerus. And so he had a, he had a lot of pull, but he, he certainly would have had uh, the ability to send money himself. And everybody thinks pretty well of somebody that, uh, that sends money, don't they? That would have been the easiest thing for him to do. But what Nehemiah did, he owned the problem personally. And he literally uh, repented for the sins of the people collectively, repented because the walls were not built up, and then he prayed about it, and then he brought the problem to the king. One of the things we said in our first week in studying uh, this, this letter was we asked the question, how many people does it take? How many people does it take for things to change or for a task to get done? Or uh, how many people does it take how many people would be required for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt? And the answer is what, Josiah? One. 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 In other words, one guy couldn't rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but it's amazing what God does with one person that says the job ought to be done. And a need seen as a task assigned. And if the job needs to be done, then I'm the guy that's going to do it. And that was Nehemiah. And it was amazing when we saw Nehemiah go back to Jerusalem survey the circumstances. And it was amazing when he brought the problem to the people who hadn't done anything about the problem. It was amazing. The Bible says, they said, we'll do it. We'll build. And then the Bible said they strengthened their hands for the work. And by application, one of the things that we saw was that the people who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem were neither qualified nor equipped. And so they got themselves equipped for it. In other words, there's so many people in the ministry on a continuous basis, on a continual basis, that oftentimes say things like, well, I'd be happy to, but I don't know how. Do you know how many people wouldn't know how if no one ever strengthened their hands for the work? What do you know that you didn't learn? What does anyone know that they haven't learned? God give us people that would say, you know, somebody needs to do that, and I don't see anybody doing it until someone else does. I'll be the guy. They just step up and do the things that need to be done. God give us people that see needs that need to be met in other people's lives. And say, you know, it's amazing how many people will point out needs and not do a thing in the world to help the need. You see a need and you say, you know, somebody ought to, and you think, man, I'll tell you, whenever I think somebody ought to, I, I mean, instantly get conviction like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, if somebody ought to, Lord, should it be me? And you know, most of the time, God, God equips us to be able to do things. Isn't it wonderful to know that what you're capable of doesn't have to be your limit because you have a God who can do anything who is limitless? And that was Nehemiah. And we saw that, you know what? Nehemiah was determined that the walls of Jerusalem would be rebuilt. And he wanted everybody to chip in and help. But you know, if no one had helped, Nehemiah would have started building those walls. Last week we saw opposition. We saw the threats against Nehemiah. We saw threats that were, you know, they, we saw first of all that the opposition mocked. They made fun of the idea or the task. Then they made fun of the work. They said, oh, you know, if a fox jumps on that wall, it'll fall down. And then we saw that they literally uh, made threats 
of war. We're going to come and we're going to kill you. And so what did they do? Well, the Bible says that, in Nehemiah it says that they had a hammer in one hand or their tools in one hand and their sword in the other. And they said, okay, all right, you come on, I'm going to build while you're, while you're uh, you know, planning to threaten. And so they just kept on building. And the work didn't stop. Then we saw that they tried by opposition to actually waylay Nehemiah. He said, hey, we want to meet with you. You come out, come out to the village here and meet with us. And Nehemiah knew that they, meant to, they intended mischief. They intended uh, to, to harm him, get him to come away, and they were going to kill him. And he said, you know what? I can't come down and leave a good work. I can't come because I'm doing something worthwhile. We saw that one of the things that God's enemy tries to do to distract people is to get them off fighting battles that aren't the battles they need to fight or doing things that aren't what we're supposed to do. And as believers, we need to be very, very much about, you know what, I know what the work is. Chris, I want to tell you something. I think the church is completely sidelined today because the church tries to do things that aren't what the church does. Instead of making sure that people know the gospel and know for sure that God is their Father and understand how to grow and help people spiritually and meet people's needs, the church is trying to be something that, that the church isn't at all. It's amazing how similar the methods of the average church today are to the methods of Walt Disney. Isn't it incredible? You know, it's amazing how much we try to compete entertainment-wise with entertainers. We're not an entertainer. We're supposed to help people with spiritual needs. You know, I've learned to tell people when they call me asking about things that aren't really what a church is defined as or supposed to do. A lot of times I tell them, you know, that isn't what we are. It's not what we do. You know, I think more churches have become charities, and I don't mean charity in the biblical sense, but I mean in the secular sense. We've gotten more into being soup kitchens than we have to being the place where people actually get legitimate, bona fide spiritual answers to their problems. And that's what we ought to be. We ought to be the place that preaches the gospel. We ought to be the place that teaches people how to have a relationship with God. We ought to preach the gospel and equip people to serve the Lord Jesus. And we ought to know what we are. We ought to be clear about it. And I believe one of the great tools of Satan is to just get us to fight a different battle or get us to do a different work than what the Lord's called us to do. We need to be very, very vigilant about that. Sometimes I think church people fight each other. Sometimes I think churches fight each other. Sometimes I think it is that we try to be entertainers or we try to uh, do something that's other than what God's called us to, and those are all tools of the opposer, the devil. We saw that last week. We saw another problem. If you were to read up to chapter 5, you'd be really encouraged by the way that the walls are rebuilt and the gates are rebuilt of the city. And now in chapter 5, there is an issue that comes up, and it's just, we'll just tell it like a story. It's what happened. In verse 1, the Bible says, There was a cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. I love the way that, the, you know, nothing's in the Scripture uh, by accident. Everything's there on purpose. And I don't know exactly how it means, the people and their wives. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it might be they have wives that say, You've got a problem to their husbands or something like that. But I uh, just love the way it's phrased. There's a cry of the people, there's a cry of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. And here we find that there was an internal issue in Israel. There was an internal issue in Jerusalem. What was the issue? Well, there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. We got a lot of us, and we have to eat. Now it's reasonable, isn't it? It's reasonable for people to say, you know what? We eat corn so we can live. Well, that's not the problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, the Bible says in verse 3, Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. And then it says in verse 4, There were also that said, We have borrowed money from the, for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyard. And then verse 5, Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children. Lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. So let's stop there. What had happened was that they needed to eat. And there was a dearth or a famine. And so, there, the, the, so food was at a premium. You couldn't grow your own. So anyone that had food sold it. And the people that they sold it to didn't have the money to buy it. And so what did they have? They had assets. 
Their asset was the land, but if you understand Israel, you recognize that the land was God's promise to the people. And even if the land was sold, it had to be sold for less than 50 years. At the end of 50 years, it reverted back in the year of Jubilee to the family that originally owned it because the land was for an inheritance. It was for God's testimony. And God gave the land to them, and He didn't want them selling it. So if something so terrible as uh, either because of mismanagement or unfortunate circumstances happened, if they sold the land, they were supposed to automatically have it revert back. So land had no more value than it had as a lease value. And the year of Jubilee happened every 50 years on the Jewish calendar, and so it could be that the year of Jubilee would be five years away, in which case, in five years, the land would revert back. And now the people started going around all God's laws and making up their own laws. Well, then let's get a lease on 50 years after the five years and so on and so forth. And they figured out ways to subvert what God wanted. It was terrible for the people and terrible for their testimony. But the one thing the people that didn't have food had was their land. And the other thing that they had was their own selves. Now, this is a matter of bondage. This is a matter of making servants out of each other. And so, maybe you needed food. A man needed food. And he came and he said, I need food and I need help. And so, somebody who was a, a, a neighbor or a friend, somebody who really is brethren because they're part of Israel, they're part of God's people, they'd say, well, if you need something, if you need food, what do you have that I could hold for, you know, for... Um, what do they call it? For an earnest or for a day, to, something to guarantee? Uh, what do they call that thing? Collateral. collateral. Thank you. I couldn't come up with the word collateral. What do you have for collateral? If I loan it to you, well, I don't really have anything. Well, you still have your, you still have that land that you inherited from your dad. Yeah, I have the land, but you know, I mean, it's not really producing a lot right now. Well, I'd be willing to take that for collateral. And first of all, they would take it for collateral on a very, very low price, and they would loan that. Then the guy, they, they would eat the corn or whatever, and they already have, already have borrowed on the land, and then they'd come and they'd say next time, well, what do you have? I don't have anything, but our family's going to starve. Well, you have a family, don't you? That boy of yours, is he a good worker? Well, I need my son to work. If he doesn't work for me, well, listen, you either gotta, you got to either eat or you got to make a deal here. Why don't you have him come over to my place and I'll have him work for me and then we'll give you corn for your family. Well, then you've not only deprived the family of their land, but you've also deprived them of their son or their daughter or so forth. They made servants out of each other. And then what happened was they were charging interest. You know, it's one thing for somebody to go through hard times and people do go through hard times sometimes, don't they? Yeah. Now, I've learned as a believer that I need to be careful not to try to interfere with what God's doing. You know what I'm talking about before? I think sometimes people go through hard times because they've done the wrong thing, they've made wrong decisions, and they have consequences. And when they never have consequences, they never really learn. So they just stay going down the path they're going down. Sometimes I look at what people are doing, and I look at the solutions that they propose, and I think, you know something? What you think would help you wouldn't help you. I don't mean it unkindly, but someone... Uh, someone who has squandered everything away, borrowed everything from everybody they know, and has lost all their friends, and is standing on a street corner begging for food, they break my heart. But I realize that five bucks isn't going to do anything for them. It's not going to help them. If I got them a hotel tonight, they'd be homeless tomorrow. And I realize that that person has gone down a path and they've made certain decisions that unless they change their way, I can't help them. I couldn't do anything to change their circumstances because they squander things that they have. And so what do they need? Well, they need to change their, the way that they do things. And so I have to be careful not to interfere with their consequences. I think a lot of help isn't help. I think a lot of help just gets in the way of consequences. We try to take away people's consequences because we do feel compassionate. And if you've ever had consequences, you understand mercy, don't you? Aren't you glad God's merciful? Man, I'll just tell you something. I don't want to begrudge God's mercy on somebody else because I've sure received enough of it. And I need a lot more of it. And I will need it in the future. So I don't want to begrudge mercy on somebody. 
But you know something, what we think is mercy sometimes isn't because God in His mercy wants people to turn from a way that's going to end in their destruction. You know, sometimes if you help somebody, you kill them. If what they think is help, is help, right? Listen, one more fix is not going to help somebody. It isn't, is it? Might kill them. One more binge isn't going to help somebody, is it? Might kill them. One more night without the consequences that would make them hit rock bottom or hit a place where they turn. And I don't know where that is for everybody, and I'm not God, and I'm not pretending to be. Don't misunderstand me this evening. But friend, it's one thing to not be willing to allow someone to have God-given consequences. It's a whole other thing to take advantage of somebody's situation, and that's exactly what was described here. In other words, here's the deal. If nationally there's a dearth, there's a famine, is in some way that famine going to affect negatively everybody to some degree? Naturally it would unless unless you happen to be in a better position and you use people's bad position to put you in a better position. Remember how Egypt was built? Like how was Egypt built? Like that. Well, just like that. I mean, literally, God told Pharaoh through a dream, through Joseph, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then there's going to be seven years of famine. And so what they do during the years of plenty, they... they uh, they sowed a lot of extra. And then everybody came to them and uh, they sold it to them and they ended up owning everything from everybody. But that's Egypt, not Israel. Egypt's a picture of the world. Israel's a picture of God and His people. And friend, I just want to tell you something. There's something wrong with the people that will take advantage of family or brethren. You ask yourself, what's wrong with making a little bit of a profit? Well, there's the, the, it's, it's the wrong question. You know, I, I've said a lot of times, <laughs> sometimes it isn't that you, there's an incorrect answer or that there's no right answer. Sometimes the problem is an incorrect question. Sometimes the problem is the question is wrong. You know, it's sort of like the have you stop beating your wife question. Wrong question. Right? Yes, I have. Well, that's an admission you beat your wife. No, I have it. It's an admission you still beat your wife. Yeah, there's no right answer for it, right? What's wrong? The question's wrong. Right? Unless it's true. There are a lot of questions like that. The question is, what's wrong with making a little bit of money? Well, that, that's the wrong question. Actually, the question is, what's wrong with taking advantage of your brethren? That's the question. That's the question. You see the difference in how you ask it? What's wrong in harming the testimony of God? What's wrong in being a laughing stock to the heathen? I'm going to just tell you something, Christian. There's two things that you ought to take home from this. First of all, you ought to never take advantage of your brethren. Second of all, if you are taken advantage of by a brother, you ought not to tell the world about it. I've seen both happen. It's a real shame. It's amazing how times, sometimes Christians will badmouth Christians, and maybe rightfully so, but instead of going to the Lord and letting God deal with it, they go to somebody that doesn't love the Lord and harms His testimony. And they even knew <laughs> the Jews are upset because we had them for slaves, and all that they could bought their brethren back. So that they, they wouldn't have to be there wouldn't have to be Jewish slaves. And now they're making slaves of each other. How's that look? How's that look? You don't want us doing it, but you do it. It's somehow better to be a slave to your family. You know, I think somehow it's worse, don't you? I mean, you expect the heathen to take advantage, but you don't expect your brother to take advantage. Can you imagine being a father or a husband? Being in a situation where you've got to feed your family, and you literally are put into the circumstances where you've got to sell the land or your family starves. Or you have to decide between selling your son or daughter into bondage and feeding your family. 
I mean, literally, it's a life or death situation. I just want to tell you something. You don't take advantage of someone in a life and death situation. Shame on someone who would. You know, it goes both ways, though, too, doesn't it? You know, I think sometimes there are folks that are just fine being needy. In other words, being the one who takes and not being concerned about being the one who gives. You ever notice some people just always seem to have a lack? It just seems as though, man, they always need help. When I was growing up at different periods of time, my dad had a couple of used car dealerships. And it's really sad, but we got to the place where we almost had a policy not to sell cars to Christians or people in our church. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, let me give you a couple of scenarios. I remember when I was young, my dad would let people go to the car auction and he'd let them buy cars at cost. Not charge them anything. And dealer cost, of course, would be substantial, especially if they got a good deal. And as a car dealer, he had a pretty good idea who not to buy cars from. And in particular cars, it wouldn't be a good idea to buy. And so he'd, he'd give them advice. He'd tell them, I wouldn't, you know, they'd go look at the cars before they went to the auction. He'd say, I wouldn't bid on that one. You know, it'll seem cheap, but it's not a good car. Or I've seen that car before. It used to have higher mileage than it does now. And the guy that's selling it's a crook. And then he'd, have, he'd give advice. And a lot of times, it's just people would go crazy. You know, they'd say, well, you know, man, that car looks good. They would either not believe him about a particular car and buy a bad one. But I remember one time my dad, for somebody in the church, went to the car auction. and A guy bought a car my dad advised him not to buy and it blew the engine on the way home. And so he ended up having to tow it to his shop for them. And the next thing he knew Sunday morning is that word was circulating that he sold a guy a car with a bad engine. <laughs> so the guy didn't pay for the engine. He felt bad about it, so he fixed the engine. And the people came and took the car, and then they never paid him for it. And still bad-mouthed him for selling a piece of junk when he told him not to buy it in the first place. It's amazing sometimes what people will do. Brethren, there are other times when similar things would happen to the point where you just didn't want to do business with people that are Christians because sometimes they take advantage of your relationship. It's kind of that way sometimes with family. Sometimes you think, well, you know, we had a, I remember Dad had a repair shop and it seemed like the family all wanted free car, free auto repair. They didn't want cost. They wanted free. You know, when you fix somebody's car, you're not able to fix someone else's. And then they wanted the parts for free. And they wanted to pay for all of it. And I remember he got to where he didn't want to fix family's cars and he didn't want to sell cars to people in our church. You know, that's too bad, isn't it? I remember something else about my dad and his used car dealership. I remember he never... He, there were certain cars he just wouldn't sell to some people. Sometimes you get something for a trade-in or you pick up something and it had potential but it was a fixer-upper. And somebody would come and they want to buy the car and Dad said, it's not a very good car for you. I remember a Camaro one time, good-looking car, and it had a bad camshaft in it. I remember a young man looking at his Camaro. It was a good-looking black Z28. It would have been like a 1979. This would have been in the late 80s. So it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been new, but it was just a good-looking car. And I wish I had it today. It would have been a pretty nice car today. But it had some engine issues. It would have been a good one for somebody that was handy to fix. But a guy, a kid wanted to buy it, and he was probably 18 or 19, and my dad told him, you don't want that car. He said, you don't know how to fix it, and you'll get taken advantage of if you try to fix it. It's just not a good deal for you. I remember he flat refused. The kid said, well, I want to buy the car. I want to just drive it until it breaks. And my dad said, it won't go long, and it would be a waste of your money. Just wouldn't sell it to him. Why? Well, he didn't want to take advantage of somebody. What we had here in Israel in Nehemiah 5 is literally people who are brethren that when their brethren were down, took advantage. And the question is, what's wrong with that? Well, everything's wrong with it. Let's go to Proverbs. Let's look at a couple of principles. And uh, then I think these principles will help us both ways. The first way they'll help us is if you're in a position of advantage to understand the danger in doing something that violates the Scripture. And the second principle would be uh, that it would help us to stay out of a position of disadvantage. So let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. And I just want to look at a couple principles. And you know, some of you may know this, but it's surprising sometimes when it comes to biblical principles of debt and so forth, how little sometimes 
we know as believers that we ought to know. The Bible says in verse 1, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Okay, now that's a mouthful, isn't it? But there's a principle that begins in verse 1. The first one is the principle of surety. You know what surety is? It's, it's what we would call co-signing today. In other words, if someone you know as a believer doesn't have the ability to purchase something outright themselves, but they want to purchase it anyway, someone else who has the ability to pay for it could actually go and co-sign. They could sign the note guaranteeing that payment will be made even if that person defaults on a loan. It's called co-signing. That's usually, or that's, that is, uh, I'm sorry, um, that is surety, not usury. It's surety. Usury is interest. So it's surety. Well, the Bible says, if you stricken your hand with a stranger, and the idea of striking hands is the idea of like a handshake. You know, and God give us, God give us people that a handshake is their, you know, that's their word, we shook hands on it, and even if it's to my own hurt, I'm going to keep my word because it's important that I do right. Even if things don't work out for me, I don't want to take advantage of you, and so forth. So you've stricken your hand with a stranger. Well, the Bible says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth, and uses the illustration of a deer trying to escape a hunter, or a bird trying to escape a fowler. In other words, anyone that lends money to somebody is, in a sense, a predator. Anyone that lends money to someone, in a sense, is a predator, and anyone who helps their friend be prey has just ensnared themselves. They have themselves become prey, and they have just hurt their friend. Uh, I've heard of financial guys that understand biblical finances say, say it this way. They say you made your friend your servant if you loan money to your friend. You want to lose a friend, loan them money. I'm serious about this. I'm joking, but I'm really, but it's really true. If you want to just get rid of somebody, you just want to uh, hurt your relationship with somebody, just loan them money. You say, Pastor, you've lent me money. Not really. I've never lent anybody money. I've never given anybody money, one, expecting more in return than I gave. And two, I've never given anybody money in the sense that I even expected to get it back. I think it's fine to say, hey, listen, if you can ever repay me, then go ahead. But I'm lending you because you have a need, not because I want something from you. There's a big difference, isn't there? I think a person who's honorable wants to pay people back if they've lent to them. Because you don't want to take advantage of somebody who would be the kind of a brother that would lend you something. But the idea here is a lender who's trying to make interest or trying to make usury is a predator. In other words, they're trying to get you. If a lender... Let me just tell you the way it is with modern day today credit. If somebody's offering to lend you something, it's because they're trying to get anything you have or you ever will have. Anybody who's loaning you something wants to get what you have or everything you ever have. Now, I'm not saying there's never an instance where it's okay to borrow. I think sometimes, you know, with the real estate in South Florida the way it is, sometimes a better idea uh, to, to get a loan on a house than it is to pay rent. Just because rent is so ridiculous. I mean, it's just getting crazy right now, isn't it? Again. And so sometimes it'd be a good idea. But I'll tell you, you're in bondage. You're a servant until you've paid it back. Why does somebody loan you money? You know what a bank hopes when you borrow money on a house? We think that the poor banks just lost their shirts in 2006 to 2009. You notice how many empty lots 
have had banks built on them in the last 10 years. Every time we were looking at a lot to buy to build a church on, a bank bought it and build a new. I, there's so many new banks that have gone up in the last 10 years. Here's the deal with the real estate market. I'm not going to get too financial, but I think we need to think as Christians and we need to take the Bible and understand how it practically works when God teaches us something. Here's what happened when banks irresponsibly lended, lent money. First of all, they had government guarantees. That is, the bank couldn't go under. The government had to bail them out. And so, literally, the taxpayers paid the money that the bankers loaned out that was a bad loan. Secondly, if you didn't have good credit, the banks always required mortgage insurance. And so when... This is, this is just crazy what happened with all these foreclosures. What happened was people bought a house, the bank loaned them more money than they, they could afford to spend, and then it got foreclosed on. And when the bank foreclosed on it, the insurance kicked in, and they actually got full payment for the mortgage and the title deed. And then they held on to the properties. You wonder, why are they holding on to the properties? They held on to the properties until the prices came back up and sold them at a premium. Do you think that they hoped that would happen? Do you think that the bankers knew that they were backed by the federal government? Do you think they knew that they were insured uh, by the insurance policies? Do you think that they were upset when they got the full amount of money that they would have gotten back and the asset and got to sell that and then loan money again for it? Not in the least. In other words, what does a banker hope? You know what a lender wants when you come into them? <laughs> they want to lend you just as much as they possibly can at a higher interest rate, as high an interest rate as they can get away with. And when they do that, they actually uh, want to loan you money for as long as you can. No creditor wants you to pay off the credit card, they just want you to pay interest. And what are they? Well, they're not your friends. Okay, let's put it that way. Someone who wants to lend you something isn't your friend. They're somebody who wants you to be in bondage to them. They want to get everything you have and everything you ever will have. Nice guy is trying to loan me money. Boy, this is great. No, nice guy actually wants you to give them everything you have and everything you ever will have. And they want to promise you whatever is necessary so they can have that. And I just want to tell you something. That is no kind of way to behave towards somebody that you love. You know, a long time ago in our church, I just told people, don't make sales in our church. Just don't come in our church and try to sell things to our people. Now, I'm not, I, I don't police that. I'm not the, you know, the lending money police or anything like that. But I'm just warning you, don't do it. Don't try to take advantage of your brother. Don't come to church to see what you can get from somebody. Come to church so that you can get something spiritual and come to church so you can give something to somebody. That ought to be our mindset, oughtn't it to be? And so we see here that the Bible says that a person who does this or helps their friend into debt has just destroyed their friendship. Okay, that's the first principle. So what's wrong? What's wrong with what happened in Israel? What's wrong with lending them corn or uh, mortgaging their, their land so they can buy corn so their family can eat? Well, the problem was they should have just given them corn. Or they should have just given them what they needed, and if they could ever pay it back, good. But if not, hey, for the testimony of God, we want this nation to survive. I want to remind you, Christian, you're never going to take anything in the grave with you, so don't take anything more than you need. It's really a good principle. I'm not saying it's wrong for believers to have wealth, but if you have wealth, you better, you better use it for the Lord. That's better be why you have it. You don't have something so that you can get from somebody else or take advantage of somebody else. Second principle, chapter 22, you have Proverbs, and uh, we'll be finished. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the first couple of verses and then uh, verse 7. Yeah, we'll read all the way to verse 7. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Now, these men in Israel that are crying out and their wives are crying out against their brethren, how's the name of the noblemen or the wealthy people that lent money so their brethren could buy corn? What kind of a name do they have? You know, names like Shark <laughs> are not good names. Are they? I, sharks have 
gone through a major rebranding in the last several years, and it still hasn't made them a, a positive animal. If you really think that sharks are friendly, loving uh, creatures of the sea, um, you're just like all the people that get their legs bitten off. If <laughs> you just don't know about sharks, go fishing sometime and see what sharks eat. They'll eat license plates, um, and they'll eat people. Sharks are really not our friends. I'm not saying we should destroy the sharks or anything like that. Don't misunderstand me. But a person who has the name of a lender or a predator or somebody who takes advantage of people and their circumstances, that's not a good name. And the Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Why would someone want to get their, their friend's land for collateral? So they could be wealthy themselves, so they could make a profit off the land. Why would someone want their neighbor's children to be their servants? Why would you want your brethren, your kinsmen, or your, your distant relatives even, to serve you? I want to stop here a second. I want us to understand something. Paul said to the church at Philippi, he said, Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. What's more Christ-like? A master or a servant? A servant is. Okay, so if you're trying to get someone to serve you, are you trying to be like Jesus? No, not really. Not really. So you and I as believers, you know it's funny a joke about getting our people to be servants, and Charlie's been working on it actually. This is the guy you got to watch out for, the guy over here in the black tie. He's trouble, I'm telling you. He has been trying to serve us here so that we'll have to serve him in the millennial reign. I know it's his trick. It's what he's been doing because the people are the greatest servants and have the most eternal rewards going to have the, the, the greatest positions in Christ's kingdom. And he just wants to rule over us in the future. That's why he serves everybody here. So just watch out for the guy. Don't let him serve you. Do something for Charlie if you get a chance just so he can't trick you. Okay? <laughs> I'm kidding about it. But, you know, we ought to have a reputation like that, shouldn't we? Being the person that, you know what, always does something for you. You know, it ought to bother you just a little bit if you reflect enough, and you ought to reflect enough to realize it, if you reflect and realize that that person serves me a lot more than I serve them. We ought to serve each other. We ought to allow each other to serve each other. But friend, you ought to want to be more of a servant than you want to be a ruler or to be served. There's something wrong with a believer that wants to be served instead of serving. We don't want to be self-serving. We don't want to be served. We want to be like Jesus. And Jesus Christ was a servant. Now listen, you don't think these are big deals. But I'm telling you, these are major philosophies that if you practice and you live by, you'll have God's blessing in your life. And there are major philosophies that if you ignore will actually create serious problems between you and the brethren and will cause you not to have God's blessing in your life. And so it's a big deal to do things God's way. So verse two, 3, the Bible says, or verse 2, the Bible says, the rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Who said that? Who did the Holy Spirit use to write verse 2 of chapter 22 of Proverbs? Solomon. Was Solomon rich or poor? Rich. Aren't you glad that God used a man who was the wealthiest man that's ever lived to say the rich and poor meet together, the Lord's the maker of them all? In other words, one of the reasons Solomon was such a wise ruler was because he was just. He was concerned with being just as fair with someone who didn't have anything that couldn't benefit him as he was with someone who could uh, do something for him. Verse 3, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on, and are punished. Now verse 3 is a verse that is a proverb, and in the sense that it's a proverb, it's a truth that could be injected into just about any circumstance and be true. But it has a context that it fits within. If you read further in chapter 22, you see it's talking about, uh, it's talking about our name and it's talking about wealth. Verse 5 or 4, the Bible says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. What's our context? Well, value. A good name's more valuable than riches. And our context in verse 2 is that God makes the rich, God makes the poor. They all meet together. In other words, they're all going to the same place. You're not better because you're rich. You're not better because you're poor. Solomon said so. The Bible says in verse uh, 3, 
A prudent man foreseeth the evil. So what's the context of a prudent man foreseeing the evil? Prudent, a person who is circumspect, who's cautious, who's wise. What evil does he foresee and hide himself? Is anybody here? Charlie, please answer. What? That which will damage his name. What? Can anybody hear him? That which will damage his name. It's things that will damage his name. You know, it'll damage your name if you're a money grubber. <laughs> it'll damage your name if you're about being a ruler instead of being a servant. You get a reputation for it. It'll hurt you. The Bible says in verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Okay, humility. Uh, who, who embodies humility more, a servant or a ruler? A servant. The Bible says riches and honor and life. Isn't it amazing what God gives to people that don't deserve it? Who deserves anything from God? What do we deserve from God? <laughs> Judgment. Yeah. We deserve for God to deal with us in kind. When we've sinned, we've sinned against God, and we put ourselves in a position of deserving judgment. And so when God gives us riches and honor in life, do we have more than we deserve? Yeah. How is it? By fear of the Lord and wisdom. By humility and fear of the Lord. Okay. Finishing up. Thorns and snares on the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. And again, that has context. It can stand alone. It has a context. Teach a kid how to think. Man, I'll tell you, I'm glad we got all these teenagers here tonight. And I want you teenagers to understand what's valued. I want you to understand it's more valuable to serve the Lord, to live for God, to make your life matter in the context of somebody else than to seek to be served and seek to have riches, seek to have things for yourself. You be godly. You be God-fearing. And the Bible says that with, with those things are riches and honor in life. In other words, who makes the poor? God. Who makes the rich? If God wants you to be poor, what do you want to be? I want to be poor. If God wants you to be rich, what do you want to be? I want to be rich. In other words, I just want to be what God wants me to be. God can take care of you. If you come to realize, I don't need to take advantage of somebody. I don't need to be trying to look to uh, use somebody or be served by somebody. I don't need to build up myself. I just need to serve God. And I need to serve others. I need to love God and I need to love others. God will take care of the things you need. I want to tell you something. I learned a long time ago by example of those that came before me and taught me things. And I learned by just living the things that I was taught that God honors faith. You just be faithful to God. You'll never lack anything you need. You compare yourself with somebody that has more than they need, maybe you won't have as much. But you know, you can, you can come out pretty good just comparing and counting your blessings. God's good. And He'll be good to you. Last verse. Verse 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I just threw my Bible down hard. didn't mean to do that. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. What happens when you lend somebody something? Well, you make them your servant. What happens when you borrow something? Well, you become a servant. You know, it's all right to be poor, just don't be a servant. And it's okay uh, to be rich, just don't be a, just don't be uh, a person who takes advantage or makes someone a servant. You and I have to be very, very wise, very circumspect in this matter. We ought to be very, very careful. Teenagers, let me just tell you something. Most, most adults spend most of their life trying to pay for decisions they made when they were late teenagers to early 20s. It's really true. Don't go into debt. Listen, you're nuts if you borrow money to go to college. I'm just telling you something. There's a, we have a whole generation of people that are in big, big trouble right now because they borrowed money to go to college. And they can't even get jobs that pay what Winsky and Anthony can make mowing grass. And yet they owe money that they'll be paying for the rest of their lives. They think they got a title or a degree and made them something. No. Just be a good person. If God wants you to go to college, he'll supply it. He'll supply your need. He did for me. I went to college, never, never owed anybody anything. I know a lot of people have done the same thing. I know a lot of people went to the same college I did, know everybody still today. It's 20 years later, maybe 100 years later. I don't know how long ago I was in college. 
We need to be wise as believers. God can't use somebody who's in bondage the way He can use somebody who's free. Did you hear me? God can't use somebody that's in bondage the way He can use someone that's free. And here I am tonight saying, I want to be used of God, don't you? I want God to use my life. I don't want to be somebody's servant. I don't want someone to be my servant. I want to be God's servant. See God do great things. I hope it's a help to you tonight. I hope you can see what Nehemiah saw. Man, when he heard about it, he let them have it. And he called the nobleman. He brought everybody out. And there the noblemen are, and they're standing there. They've lent money to their brethren. And he said, you've done wrong. And you ought to just let everybody pay you back for what they pay. And you need to give them back their land. How are they going to pay you back without their land? You've taken advantage. And they said, yeah, we've done wrong. And guess what they did? <coughs> They did what anyone can do. They got right and got forgiven. And all of a sudden, they turned, their, their, they, they turned from what they were to something else. And that's our conclusion this evening. My friend, you may have borrowed, and you say, well, I didn't know what God said about it. Well, don't do it anymore and ask God to deliver you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? God, would you forgive me for something I did? It wasn't right. Would you help me get out of it? Man, you'd be amazed at how God will deliver somebody that wants to live. Wants to be delivered. And then God, you know what? I, I took advantage. I didn't realize I was taking advantage. We'll make it right. And God will make you right. It's amazing how simple it is to get forgiveness. When Jesus paid it all, He died on the cross for our sins. And God offered deliverance. God offered salvation to every person that calls on the name of the Lord Jesus. And He, and he offered more than just, you know what? You can be delivered. You don't have to be condemned. But... You can have eternal life and you can have forgiveness. And God will forgive you. And God will let you just take it from where you're forgiven and He'll help you from there. It's a wonderful thing that we have such a benevolent, gracious God, isn't it? And I hope you know more about how to live from what we see in His Word tonight. Man, I'll tell you what I've learned about the Word of God and just how to treat people and just about how to handle finances and borrowing and lending and usury and surety. Man, they made some major decisions in my life that have enabled me to serve God in a way I could not have otherwise. And I hope uh, teenagers will listen to it, be wise about it, I hope our adults will see hope in it. And uh, continue if you've done well. Father, we pray we thank you for what you've taught us this evening. We ask that you would increase the truth in our hearts and allow us to practice it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you're dismissed.